With the conclusion of Infinity Train after its fourth season, it's about time we finally constructed a complete timeline of this show, which, let's face it, has a lot of flashbacks, intertwined plot lines happening more or less at the same time, and things happening out of order. So if you wanted everything cleared up, this is the video for you. With that said, I'm Jeremy, and this is the complete timeline of Infinity Train. We begin with the origins of the train itself, and sadly, we don't actually know that much about it. The only hint we get is from the cat in the third season, in which it is suggested that the train is centuries old, possibly even older than normal trains are. For the record, the concept of a vehicle moving across tracks is very old, dating as far back as the ancient Greeks, but what we would call a train wouldn't come into existence until the invention of the steam engine in the early 1800s. But given that the infinity train is basically magical and possibly interdimensional, we can definitely give them the benefit of the doubt here. Also at some point, 1-1 was created by an unknown entity and became the conductor of the train itself. The first named character we know to have boarded the train is the cat, sometimes also known as Samantha. She has been on the train for at least 150 years, but this number could have been higher. At some point, she met up with a young boy named Simon Laurent for a few months, but after they were attacked by a gome, she slipped through an opening that he couldn't fit through, and so she left him behind. But the real story of the show begins with Amelia Hughes. In her childhood, she was kind and caring and befriended a boy named Ulrich Timmons. They stayed friends for years, eventually developing into a romantic relationship, and they even went through engineering school together in the United Kingdom. Only a few years later, in 1966, two boys named Ryan Akagi and Mingi Park were born, who were pretty much destined to be best friends. Even their incubators immediately after their births were right next to each other. Ten years after that, in 1976, Amelia and Ulrich graduated, and soon thereafter got engaged. But before they could get married, Ulrich died in an accident. That's as specific as we know although creator Owen Dennis did once tweet out that Ulrich died in a dirt biking accident. But whether we should see this as canonical is debatable. Whatever way it happened, Amelia was devastated by this, leading the train to appear before her. Much like all the passengers, she was lost enough that she got on and would remain there for the next 30 years. At some point, she met up with the conductor, one one, and given how the cars can be anything, she begged him to make her a car in which Ulrich was alive. Around the same time, a man named Jeremy Bradford had a car accident while driving on a foggy day with his wife and daughter, which killed them both. Distraught, the train appeared before him as well, and he boarded it just like everyone else. In the train, he met up with Kez, a floating, talking concierge bell, and Morgan, a living castle. Jeremy spent five years living in the castle, trying to figure out how to get off the train. It took him that long to figure out that he was haunted by his survivor's guilt and that he was still in that fog. However, in the meantime, Morgan formed a deep bond with Jeremy. So when she learned that Kez helped him figure out a way to exit the train and go back to his own world, she was furious. Back with Ryan and Min, the two dreamed of becoming a musical duo, but when given a chance at a high school battle of the bands, Min chickened out, leaving Ryan to go it alone. After high school, they split ways, with Ryan touring through Canada as a musician and Min working at a diner to earn enough money to pay his way through college. However, after a few years, Ryan returned to his friend and during an argument, they fell into a portal that takes them aboard the Infinity Train. Here, they would be met by Kez, who is not entirely honest with them about their current predicament. This is also where Amelia's story starts to intertwine with that of Ryan and Min, as one one shows them getting onto the train to her. When she wonders about why two of them were selected at the same time, one simply replies that the algorithm has determined that this was the best course of action, as anything can happen on the train given enough time. She wondered what would happen if they wouldn't learn to get along, and one calmly replied that they would both die in that case. Over the course of their time on the train, they do learn to work together, but not without infuriating a lot of people, including a caterpillar judge who turns into a butterfly, a giant pig baby, and ultimately, Kez guides them to the castle in the midst of a giant maze, which is, of course, Morgan. Morgan is still angry at Kez for letting Jeremy go, but still allows Ryan and Min to stay there. We also get some more hints about Amelia's rise to power and gradually gaining influence over the train, despite being a passenger. 
One refused to make her a car where her fiancé is still alive, however, sending her into a fit of rage. She ripped one out of his socket and sent him to the snow car, where because of his short stature he was unable to reach the doors, leaving him essentially trapped. Now in control over the train, she did what one wouldn't do for her, attempt to recreate a car where her fiancé was still alive. However, she ignored his statement that it would go against the rules of the train and that it would end badly, which is precisely what happened. Her story aligns with Ryan and Min's when a steward appears, right before Kez, Ryan, and Min figure out what has been holding them back. Kez finally apologizes to Morgan and all the creatures she has wronged over the years, and Ryan and Min apologize to each other for their mutual shortcomings. With this, the portal opens and they are free to leave. But after this, there's something of a gap in the timeline, and we probably jump forward about 20 years or so, to one of Amelia's failed attempts at recreating Ulrich, because instead she creates a girl named Hazel. Much like all of her creations though, Amelia cannot shake the turtle motif, and Hazel was left as a half-turtle girl. She was created in the unfinished car, but more on her later. Around this time, a girl named Grace Monroe is born, who grows up extremely isolated due to her parents insisting on following private education. Even though her family was rich, she was never happy due to her loneliness, as her parents never spent much time with her, instead hiring assistants and tutors to take care of her. With one particularly galling incident leaving her as the laughing stock of a class she was forced into by one of her tutors, she started resorting to petty theft just to get her parents to notice her. Sometime after this, the train appeared before her and she got on as well. Now we get to season one, or rather a little bit before season one, and the divorce of Andy and Megan Olson. Their marriage had been unstable for a while, but it had quite the impact on their daughter Tulip. It's a bit of an open question whether or not they were good parents, as both of them considered themselves too busy to properly take care of their 13-year-old daughter, or at least spend time with her. While Tulip is good friends with a girl named Michaela, she is seemingly most happy when spending time on her own. It's her anger at her parents' inability to make time for her that causes the train to appear in front of Tulip. Seemingly by chance, she's dropped into the snow car, where she runs into one, or as she calls him, one one. Realizing that she is now trapped, she decides that the logical thing to do is to make her way toward the front of the train and ask the conductor what is going on. One of her first stops is the Corgi car, where she runs into Atticus. Now, Atticus does claim to have become the king of Corginia by uniting the Cardigans and the Pembrokes, but we never actually get an answer as to how and when this happened. More relevantly, this is Tulip's first run-in with a steward, who was sent by Amelia to try and find the right sphere so that she could recreate Ulrich. But this effort by the robot kept causing damage to Corginia, until he was chased away by Tulip and Atticus. Deciding they need to find the responsible party and bring them to justice, Atticus decides to go with Tulip on her quest to find the conductor. They run into the cat, who mostly tries to deceive them, because she is secretly working for Amelia. The cat is far more knowledgeable than she's letting on, as she also knows One One's true identity, though she doesn't tell either him or Tulip, since she just wants to be left in peace by Amelia, with whom she has a, let's be generous and call it a contentious relationship. She almost manages to trap Tulip in her own memories, but Tulip escapes instead, and continues her journey forward not realizing that the conductor is already looking for her and one one. The next important stop is the chrome car, where Tulip comes across her reflection, Mirror Tulip, or MT for short. Even though she initially tries to deceive the original Tulip, they soon come to the realization that they have to work together in order for both of them to escape particularly M.T., who is being hunted by the Mirror Police. Realizing that M.T. was only trying to escape, Tulip decides to help her, and does so with the help of her multi-tool. The two go their separate ways, and this is where the story of Season 2 begins, technically. An undisclosed amount of time passes between this episode and the first episode of Season 2. For the sake of keeping things clear, we're going to continue with Season 1 and join up with M.T. again later. Because of the actions of the cat, a steward manages to track down Tulip and One One, and while they survive the attack, Atticus gets turned into a golem. Tulip is heartbroken to see her friend get turned into a mindless monster like that, so instead she takes the cat's offer to watch another tape, this one of Amelia's memories, revealing the truth about the conductor to Tulip. As a final favor, though in truth, also to end the stalemate, 
The cat offers to take Tulip to the front of the train, which she also agrees to. Everything descends into a huge fight, and one one takes his rightful place as the conductor of the train again, undoing all of Amelia's tampering, and Tulip manages to restore the gome to Atticus, after which Tulip gets through to Amelia about letting go of the past, and more prominently, Ulrich. But with this, Tulip is finally ready to leave the train and go home. Rewinding a little while to mirror Tulip right after leaving the chrome car, the first thing we see MT do is give herself a complete makeover from the last time we saw her, giving her quite the grunge look. She meets up with another passenger of the train, Jesse Kose. After an initially rough start, MT decides to help Jesse get his number to zero so that he can leave the train. MT is still a wanted fugitive though, something that she doesn't initially tell Jesse, even though he thinks she should have told him that. She finds out that Jesse has a tremendous problem standing up for himself, and this is what led him to the train in the first place. Similar to the real Tulip, they run into the cat as well, who it turns out continued her con artist lifestyle, telling them that they need to play her game in order to get out of the car. When MT realizes that she is getting fewer points than Jesse because passengers get preferential treatment over denizens, she runs off angrily, and much to her surprise, Jesse actually chases after her. Because this causes his number to go down, it gives them the motivation to win enough games to leave the car. Before they can do this, however, they are stopped by a woman called Grace, who takes them to the group calling themselves the Apex. They believe that rather than a low number being the best, they believe higher numbers are better, and that Amelia, with her immensely high number, is the true conductor of the train, not one one. On top of that, they believe that denizens who don't have numbers, like MT, are so-called nulls, who have no feelings and no thoughts. Jesse, realizing that what Apex is doing is wrong, goes back for MT, which finally causes his number to reach zero, as he is now standing up for himself. He gets sucked into his portal and Grace betrays MT by bringing a mirror to summon the mirror police, who come to arrest her. Unwilling to go, MT runs for it, but one of the agents handcuffs her to himself and they get tossed off of the train with him sustaining heavy injuries. With some considerable effort, she makes it back to the train, frees herself from the agent, and comes to the realization that her chance for a number necessary to get off the train is in the new arrivals. At the engine, she meets up with one one, who does recognize her, but he refuses to give her a number, saying those are only for passengers. However, he does discover that Jesse is still in processing, and so they wake him up where he manages to reflect his number onto her chrome hand, which one one considers good enough and he lets them both go. Once out in the real world, they are dropped off right on Jesse's doorstep, where they are met by Jesse's younger brother, Nate, the whole reason the train appeared to him in the first place. When he asks her for MT's name, she looks at the lake, the first reflective surface she comes across that isn't either a prison or a threat to her, and decides that as good a name as any for her, Lake. In most recent events, we join the story of Apex, shortly after their encounter with Lake and Jesse, while they are raiding another cart. They come across the same unfinished car that Tulip came across, but before they can smash everything, the car begins to shift, separating Grace and another Apex member called Simon from the rest of the group. With their equipment damaged, the only way they have to get back to the rest of their group is on foot, so they set off. They soon come across Hazel, the little girl accidentally created by Amelia, who does have a number even though it isn't functional. This is good enough for Simon and Grace, who take her in to become a member of Apex. Hazel is also accompanied by a gorilla called Tuba, who, being a denizen, Simon and Grace don't trust, but they don't have much of a choice. They do start plotting to get rid of him eventually, but first they have to get back to their group. However, on their travels, as Grace learns more and more about the history that Hazel and Tuba share, she becomes increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of getting rid of him. Unbeknownst to her, at least initially, the slow realization that Apex isn't on the right side of history in the train causes her number to go down. Simon does end up killing Tuba, something that by now earns him scorn from Grace, and devastates Hazel, who reveals her turtle form. Soon enough, though, Simon and Grace realize that the number tracker they had been using wasn't tracking a high cluster of numbers which they assumed would be Apex, but rather Amelia, who has the single highest number ever recorded. Because Amelia mentions that all of her cars had turtles in them, and those were being ejected by one one, Grace becomes concerned that Hazel was the cause of it. 
Simon abandons them, becoming concerned that Grace is starting to doubt Apex's creed, and is convinced that this would make her find her way back. Unbeknownst to him, however, Amelia helps Grace and Hazel out, and when they learn of her story, Grace becomes aware that getting her number to zero is the true goal of being on the train. Simon returns to them, but he doesn't believe Amelia's story. Instead, he starts believing that she has lost her way as the true conductor of the train, and is now trying to brainwash Grace instead. Amelia laughs this away and tells Simon to consider that maybe he is wrong and not Grace. She also reveals that Hazel was the result of her failed attempts at recreating Ulrich, and that her defunct number was the same as Amelia's when she first boarded the train. Grace tries to save face in front of Simon, but he finds out that night that she knew about Hazel's true status as a denizen all along. With Simon now in the know, Hazel declares that she no longer feels safe with him and instead decides to go with Amelia to figure out what they are going to do. Grace is very upset at this and lashes out at Simon over it. He traps her in her own memory while he leaves in an attempt to take over Apex and reform it. Grace finally sees the true error in her way and why she was taken aboard the train in the first place. Namely, her fear of disappointing others and ending up alone, which ultimately still happened. But with this, and one final apology to her memory of Hazel, she finds her way back out of the memory, where she fixes Simon's destruction of the car she is currently in, wipes the Apex symbol off her face, and heads out to find the rest of Apex. When she finds them, now under the leadership of an increasingly unhinged Simon, he declares her a void, a traitor to Apex, and needs to be thrown under the train's wheels. Instead, she manages to fight off Simon, as her own newfound efforts to repair the damage she caused come back to save her, while Simon is so consumed by his lust for power that he gets trapped by a gome, which subsequently kills him. Grace tells the others in Apex that they have been going about things the wrong way, and that she can no longer lead them. With this, her number goes down to the lowest we've ever seen it, and she can finally work to lower it down to zero. What happens to Apex is up in the air, as Grace tells them that they'll figure it out. And that's it! The entire timeline of Infinity Train and all the characters in it. There is a lot of overlap between the seasons, so I really hope this is helpful if you were looking to make sense of it all. Let us know in the comments below if it did help, and remember to subscribe while you're there for new content every week. And remember, Frederator loves you!